Gentlemen, enjoyment. John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Now look, Shaw, Johnny. Oh, yes, Mr. Shaw. Our copy holds a policy on Miss Judith Thompson. Uh, she was killed. How? Uh, somebody shot her. You'll have to go to Los Angeles. I'll book space right away. Come on down to the office as soon as you can, and I'll give you the details. Shaw and the Shane, and I'm yours. <laughs> return to our program in a moment. But first, I'd like to say a few words about jamming. And I don't mean mother's preserve. During wartime, it has frequently been the practice of an enemy country to jam our radio communications. That is, to cut into our broadcasting with broadcasting of their own so that our radio messages cannot be received with any degree of clarity. There was a time when our civilian radio broadcasts were jammed too, unintentional though it was. As you can imagine, it was quite a mess, and still could be. Can you imagine what would happen today if there was no coordination among our many radio and TV stations? Or if the telephone companies didn't cooperate? When radio broadcasting first began in our country, each station chose its own call letters, power, and spot on the dial. It wasn't long before two or three stations would try to come in on the same spot. And the poor listener couldn't understand the thing he heard. So, to get things organized, the Federal Communications Commission was born. Licenses were issued to each station and to qualified operating engineers. The same thing now applies to TV stations. Today, a radio or TV station may request certain call letters, and if no one else has them, the call letters are issued. But power and the spot on the dial are restricted by laws of nature. And the FCC engineers don't have much choice in what they tell the station operator he can or cannot do. With the telephone and telegraph, however, the situation is different. The FCC makes sure the rates are fair both to the company and to the consumer, and that all the independent companies work together so that someone in Japan or Germany, for example, can call someone else in New York with practically no delay or trouble. So the next time you pick up a stateside broadcast loud and clear or hear everything your family says to you over the telephone, just remember that you have the Federal Communications Commission to thank. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Law Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Black Doll matter. Expense account item one, $189.95. Plain fare and incidentals to Los Angeles, California. I arrived at 10 o'clock the morning of the 12th and went directly to Hollywood, where I registered at the Wentworth Hotel then proceeded to Central Division Homicide and Lieutenant Brickford. I got a teletype this morning that you were coming, Doyle. Oh, we should give you all the help I can. Oh, I'll be glad to have it. Can you tell me something about the dead woman? Well, shot once with a 38 in the chest. Killed between 1 and 2, night before last. Any suspects? Yeah, we've been checking on the people she knew. Talked to several of them. Couple, Mr. and Mrs. Lyon, a girlfriend, Miss June Fisher. She'd seen her during the day, but can't tell us very much. The Lions hadn't seen her for several days. They couldn't give us any reason why someone might kill him. We've got some more names we've got to run down. Boyfriend, uh, the, uh, the William Carnes. Works for Timken Aircraft and test pilot. Girlfriend says Carnes and the dead girl started seeing each other about two weeks ago, but uh, she didn't believe it was anything particularly serious. She was killed in her apartment. Yes. Yeah. Killed entered by back door and flipped the screen, but it wasn't robbery. Nothing was touched. Somebody just walked in and killed her. Yeah. That's the way it looks. Lab hasn't come up with anything that'll help so far. No print. They got the bullet, but we need the gun. What did she do that night? Well, that's something we still got to find out. We are pretty sure she went out. There were some clothes on the chair, slacks, and a coat. Wouldn't wear the coat around the house. Oh. What about this boyfriend? I was going out to talk to him this morning. I wanted to check on him first. Pilot in the last war. Went to work for Timken right after he was discharged. And, uh, he seemed like a pretty solid citizen. A lot of citizens are pretty solid until they kill somebody. Yeah. Well, you want to run out the field with me? If you don't mind. Well, not a bit. 
Give me somebody to talk to. Five minutes later, we were driving through the gate at Timken Aircraft. As we passed the long, low line of gray buildings, I saw a plane sitting on the starting line. A bullet-shaped jet with stubby, swept-back wings. Inside the main building, we were shown into Mr. Rudolph Timken's big presidential office. Oh, come in, gentlemen. Which is Lieutenant Rickford? I am, sir. And this is Mr. Dahmer. Ah, I'm pleased to know you. What can I do for you? Well, we'd like to talk to one of your pilots, Mr. Timken. William Carnes. Bill? Well, certainly, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait a while. He's just getting ready to take up the XR-200. Is that the jet I saw on the line? Yes, it's a beauty. So, thank you. We think it's the best. Hey, if you'd like to come out on the field, this test isn't security. The last two years we've been under wraps, but since we got the budget out and the Army's given us a contract, uh, would you like to watch? Oh, sure would. Simpkin took us out in the field, and we watched the jet take off and climb toward the west. It circled, climbing till it was out of sight. We kept watching and waiting. A cool breeze was coming in from the ocean, and the sun was warm on our faces. Finally, we saw it. Here he comes. Can't even hear him. He's traveling faster than sound. Do you fly, Mr. Dolly? Only when I've got an expense account. How fast would you say he's going? <laughs> You'd be very surprised, Lieutenant. Even the Army was. Oh. <laughs> He's in his turn now. There. Yeah. Uh, come in across the field. He's even lower. Here he is. field until William Carnes landed the plane. Then we went back to Timken's office. The president of Timken Aircraft gave orders for Carnes to report as soon as he could. And about 20 minutes later, the young pilot was shown in. Timken introduced us and then left. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? Yeah, just a few questions. Do you know a Miss Judith Thompson? Yeah, what's wrong? She's dead. Somebody killed her. Killed her? Don't you read the papers, Bill? Yeah, well, usually, but, uh, I've been so busy the last couple of days. She was killed night before last. What did you do night before last? Stayed home. Any way of proving it? Well, no, I, I live alone. I just stayed in. You don't think I killed her? You've known her for about two weeks, haven't you? Yeah, I guess it's been about two weeks. She's a nice kid. Awfully nice kid. Sorry about it. And you stayed home the night of the 10th? That's right. All night? Well, yeah. You'll find out sooner or later. No. I wasn't her. I took her out the night of the tenth, and I knew she'd been killed. But look, honest, I had nothing to do with it. Why'd you lie about it? Because I'm married. No, we're not living together. We're separated. My wife's living in Chicago now with her folks. I've always kind of hoped we'd get back together, but if I got mixed up in a killing... You got mixed up the night you took Judith Thompson out? Look, uh, I was lonesome. Judy was a pretty kid. I saw her about six times in two weeks. It helped. But I'm in love with my wife. I've always been in love with her. You can understand it, can't you? Sure. The night of the tent, where did you and Judy go? To the beach. Went down on the pier and played a concession. When did you get home? Mm, I don't know. I guess about 11.30 or so. Yeah, somewhere about that time, 11.30 or 12. You go right home? Yeah, right home. That's true. Anything happened during the evening? Anything uh, unusual? Unusual? Anybody following you? No. And Judy seem nervous or anything? No, she was fine. She didn't act nervous or anything. <laughs> okay. Is that all? Yeah, for now. We'll talk to you again. All right, but I sure wish you wouldn't tell the papers. Tell the papers? What about me? Being the one who took her out that night. It would finish me for good with my wife. I wouldn't have a chance. The family doesn't like me as it is. Why did you and your wife split up? My job. I don't really blame her. It's tough for a woman to sit around the house and an old man is flying new stuff. What am I going to do? I guess I love flying about as much as I do my wife. Just keep hoping she'll understand and... I don't know. It's the best. Well, we'll see you later. Okay, Lieutenant. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Nice meeting you. We left time sitting in a big office. 
and located Timken. We thanked him for his cooperation, then went out to the car. We were about to drive away when Joe Carnes ran out of the building. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Just thought of something. Yeah? What is it? All right. I doubt if it means anything. In fact, I forgot all about it until just a minute ago. Something about the other night? Yeah. Well, we were down on the pier on the flight. You know, playing the concession. I down there had a fight. Fight? Yeah, that's the shooting gallery. I spent about two dollars knocking down pipes and winning coupons. When I got done, Judy wanted one of the draws, you know, the plaster prizes. Yeah. This was a big black one that's about this big. And the guy wouldn't give it to me. You got in a fight with him? Oh, darn, yeah. I bought enough coupons for the draw, but he said it wasn't a prize. And I said, what have you got it up on the shelf for? Judy wanted it, so I finally made him give it to me. Then we had to fight him for it. Hey, it wasn't so much the draw, it was the principle. I hate to be had like that. No. Yeah. Well, it isn't much, but it was kind of strange. Of course, I don't know what it could have to do with Judy. Well, you never know. Uh, does she take the doll home with her? Oh, yeah, sure. And a lot of other things we want, you know, kind of junk. Mm. Okay, Bill. Thanks a lot. Sure. See you later. Yeah. Bye. 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 from the pier was. I remember it scattered all over the dressing. Scattered? Yeah. But no big black doll. You were right. Black one. That is funny. in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? According to historians, no other single man ever did as much for a country as this president did for the United States. After a brilliant military career, he was called from retirement to preside at a federal convention in Philadelphia where he was unanimously chosen president. He was also unanimously re-elected for a second term, but refused to run for a third. Although a Federalist, he named a man from another party, Thomas Jefferson, as Secretary of State. If you don't have his name by now, here are two more clues. During his presidency, the cotton gin was invented, and the first census was taken. Who was he? George Washington, first president of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. <laughs> star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Lieutenant Brickford drove across town to the dead girl's apartment just off Franklin Avenue in Hollywood. A uniformed cop was still staked out at the door. He gave Brickford a casual salute as we let ourselves in. Here. Shot from where? Uh, from over here. And position of the body and wound puts the killer somewhere in um, in this area here. Which way is the back door? Uh, through there. And then um, here's the stuff on the dresser. Uh huh. Everything you'd win at an amusement pier. Everything, but a big black doll. Why would a plaster doll be so important? I couldn't even guess. Well, it's the only lead you've got so far. You want to check it, I suppose. Confessions on the pier are open around six. You got any plans for this evening? I'm with you. Let's go talk to Bill Corns again. I think it'd be a good idea if he came along with us tonight. We left the dead girl's apartment and drove back across town to Bill Corns' home near the Timpkin Aircraft Factory. Bill met us at the door and showed us into an attractive living room. To find out any more about... Oh, about Judy? Yeah, not yet. We'd like to know some more about your argument as a peer. Well, I, I, I told you just about everything. It started over the doll. That's right. You're sure Judy had the doll with her when she went home? Well, yeah, I'm positive. 
So I'll take it into the house. Had it on. Full of that stuff we want. Doll was the biggest of the bunch. Mm. You, uh, you can't remember anything unusual about the doll? Unusual? No. No, I mean, it's just a big black doll about, about this big, holding an ashtray. You'd know this guy again? Oh, sure, sure, I'd know. He runs a concession. At least he was the, the only one there. Well, uh, can you go down with us tonight? To the pit? Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. You think the argument had something to do with Judy getting killed? We don't know. But that black doll wasn't in her apartment. It wasn't? But I saw her take it in with her. Well, it looks like somebody else took it out. Expense account item two, $14.55. Dinner for Brickwood, Carnes, and myself. A short drive later, we pulled into the big parking lot on the amusement pier. As we got out of the car, the roller coaster reached the top of the first dip high above us and started down. Out of the pier. I haven't been down here in a long time. Where's the shooting gallery? It's down at the other end. We walked the length of the pier until we reached the shooting gallery where Bill had won the black doll. All right, step up and sign that up. The man running the concession was in his late 40s, short, stocky, and bald. We stopped a few yards away. Come on, boys, let's do that thing to catch the ball. Report. What can we win? Anything on the shelf. On the top shelf, one just like it. How about the big black doll? Sure, but you gotta hit all the clay pipes. Well, go ahead, darling. Aren't you gonna try it? Mm, if you don't hit them all. Oh, yeah. There you are. everything you know about Charlie Gilbert. Rick and I questioned and cross-questioned the manager of the shooting gallery. He said his name was Virgil Wellman, but he'd never seen Charlie Gilbert till the night he'd hired him three weeks before. He knew very little about the man, but readily admitted Gilbert had a bad temper. He swore he didn't know where Gilbert lived or what he did in his spare time. Well, he left the pier and drove Bill home. The lieutenant dropped me off at my hotel. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the dinner. What happens now? Well, get some sleep and try to find Gilbert. Well, you got a pretty good description. Yeah. I'll put out an APB and take the mug. Just might have a reckon. I'm going to check on that guy at the shooting gallery, too. I think I've seen that face somewhere. What are you going to do with the doll? Have the lab look it over. Bet you don't find anything. Then I'll give it back to you. You want it. Gee, thanks. It's just what I always wanted. <laughs> it's nice. Good night. I went to my room, climbed into bed, and 
tried to put the puzzle together. After a half dozen cigarettes, I gave up and turned off the light. I felt as though I'd hardly fallen asleep. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Johnny Dollar. Oh, hi. Hey, what time is it? Two o'clock. Goodbye. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing important. Okay. Let me wake up. Let me go wake you up. About an hour ago, they hauled a man out of the ocean. Been shot twice. About 36 hours. Who is he? I don't know. No identification. Having enough fire on his print. So he's sent for a kickback from Washington. Why is this corpse so important? Because he fits the description Carnes and Wellman gave us. Gilbert? Yeah. And I went through the mugs and came up with an identification on the guy who was running the shooting gallery tonight. I know I'd seen him before. Who is he? Right name's Virgil Shelton. Wellman's an alias. Got a narcotics record. Served five years. Only been out for a couple of months. Well, that sounds interesting. How about the dead man you found in the ocean? Carnes coming in to make an identification? Already sent for him. Coming down? Right away. Expense account item three, two dollars and sixty cents, cab fare to the city hall. Well, I went directly to Homicide and Lieutenant Brickford. Carnes had not yet arrived, so Brickford showed me the morgue and record on the shooting gallery owner, then took me down to the morgue. The man they pulled out of the sea certainly fitted the description of Gilbert. Shortly afterward, Carnes was shown in to make the identification. Yeah. 
Oh, this one's dead. Uh, Virgil's still with us. Yeah. Take his gun for a second. I want to look in that box. Yeah. You got a match? Yeah, I'll let you. Well, looky here. Dolls. Big black dolls. And look what's inside. Mr. Dollar, looks like we've just cracked a king-size narcotics ring. Sure looks that way, Lieutenant. Virgil Wellman lived long enough to tell us the whole thing. Once a week, one of the big black dolls was passed to a pickup. The night Carnes had the argument was one of those times. Gilbert nearly couldn't take a chance on a fight that would bring the police. So he gave Carnes the doll, closed the shooting gallery, and followed. Judith Thompson surprised him in the act of stealing the doll, and he had to kill her. Virgil Wellman knew Carnes would be able to identify Gilbert, and with a murder, the police would be sure to investigate. So he killed Gilbert and dumped him off the pier. Expense account items four, five, and six. $260.50. Hotel bill, breakfast, and plane fare back to Hartford. Lieutenant Brickford drove me to the airport, thanked me, and gave me the big black dial I'd won at the shooting gallery. It looks awful, but it makes a fair ashtray. Expense account total, $467.60. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Again tomorrow night at the same time, 9.05. Then at the end presents My Favorite Husband and the 